And today we're gonna be doing some Q&A. So some people have given me questions in advance and then anything that comes up in today's session, feel free to uh, write something in the box on the side and I can address that as well in real time. Um, I just want to put out that disclaimer as always. This is for educational and inspirational purposes only. Um, this is not medical nutrition therapy or one-on-one -on -one counseling and it's not um, a good replacement for that. So just keep that in mind that a lot of these things that I'm gonna talk about today um, might vary for an individual. So I'm gonna try to keep it more um, relevant to everybody and not super specific um, for specific questions about your personal care, especially if it relates to medical conditions. That's something that you would need to see a dietitian one-on-one um, -on -one for. Okay. So for those who just joined, feel free um, if any questions come up along the way, um, anything you're wondering about intuitive eating, uh, nutrition, um, anything you think that I might know something about, uh, feel free to ask the question um, in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna start with, how do you know when you are ready for intuitive eating? And my answer to that would be that you're, you're close to it if you have an open mind to intuitive eating. Um, so if you are getting to the point where you can accept that diets don't work, that you're not going to lose weight really quickly um, and keep it off, then I think you're ready for intuitive eating. Um, and everyone's going to come into it at a different place. So maybe you're not feeling ready for... Um, maybe like incorporating exercise in a, in a healthful way, or maybe you're not ready for um, challenging the diet police that might be like a family member or something like that. Um, but you might come in at a place where you can work on other parts of intuitive eating and kind of gradually build to become an intuitive eater. It takes time. Um, the expectation that anyone would come in and just be ready to go and be an intuitive eater in a week or two is really, that's just not the reality. I've never seen anyone do that. Um, but if people really embrace the process, I have seen um, really wonderful results really quickly when people finally give themselves permission to eat food that they enjoy, um, permission to challenge diet messaging. Uh, there are changes that occur pretty quickly um, and kind of redefining success. And it, success might not be weight loss. It might be having a healthy relationship with food, being able to eat foods you like and not having a fear that you're going to overindulge in them. Um, so yeah, so I think pretty much everybody's ready for intuitive eating. If you're here, it means that you have an open mind. It means that um, you at least have some skepticism around uh, dieting, that it probably hasn't worked for you in the past. And that's totally reasonable because it hasn't worked for really 95 to 98% of people. So um, you're not alone in that. Diets are not sustainable. They really don't work long term. Okay. Next question I got. Um, what if I don't have normal hunger and fullness cues? And this one makes it a little tricky. And so some people who have struggled with binge eating don't have normal fullness cues in particular. And so when intuitive eating is, you know, honoring your hunger, eating until fullness, um, that's an oversimplification, there's more to it, but if you're not able to acknowledge, identify that fullness, then it's gonna be really hard to honor the fullness. You're gonna to continue to eat beyond that point, especially if you enjoy food, which most of us do. So um, like I said, people are gonna come into intuitive eating at, a different, at different places. So for some people, starting with more of a structured eating pattern um, may be indicated so that you're kind of learning portion sizing and learning um, what an appropriate amount of food might look like as dictated by a dietitian, not um, some sort of fad diet or your personal trainer, um, but learning what your body really needs to be well nourished. And um, then eventually being able to, as those, hung, as those fullness cues come back in the next you know, couple of months to potentially longer, um, then you might be able to start working on knowing what that fullness feels like anticipating when it's going to come and being able to be more intuitive in that way. But in the meantime, there are lots of other ways. So even if you have more of a structured meal plan, there are other ways that you can work toward becoming an intuitive eater. Um, so working toward choosing foods um, that are satisfying to you. So 
when I say structured meal plan, what that would realistically look like would be, you know, this much protein and this much, you know, grains or starches and this much vegetable, this much fats. Um, and then within that, you'd be able to still choose foods that you genuinely enjoyed. So when I say structured meal plan, I don't mean chicken, rice, broccoli, um, anything super specific like that, more just like the amounts and the balance of meals. So you can work on choosing foods that are satisfying, that make you feel good physically and emotionally to um, an extent. There's another part that you can work on, which is challenging diet mentality, challenging diet culture, challenging the messages that we get um, or that we may have gotten in the past about what we're supposed to eat and how much. Um, and so even if you might not be ready to totally embrace it, being able to um, start to at least challenge that is something you can work on right off the bat. Another thing you work on is making peace with food. And this is a really hard one because we tend to blame the food. Um, you know, I can't have, quote, I can't have Cheetos in the house. I can't have ice cream in the house. I can't have this or that. Um, and it really vilifies the food. And in reality, it's not the food, it's the behavior around it. Um, and maybe the relationship with food that's created this um, off limits, but then when you have it overindulge type of relationship with the food. So you can work toward making peace with the foods that it's not about the foods, it's about the behaviors around them. Um, working to respect your body, that's another principle of intuitive eating and accepting um, your body and for all that it does for you. Um, you know, getting to a place where you can kind of make peace with the genetic blueprint that you have. Um, that's another thing you can work on right off the bat, even if you don't have fullness cues. Um, and then doing the deeper work. So, um, you know, getting the help that you need, which could be coming here, it could be seeing a therapist one-on-one, -on -one, um, but getting to where you have an understanding of why you developed the relationship with food that you have and working to uh, repair it as well. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions about like hunger and fullness levels and as far as what you might be able to work on outside of that? Okay. All right. So here is another question. Hi, Amy. I've been trying intuitive eating this week with some wins and some not so great meals like dinner tonight. It seems that when I've let myself get too hungry, it's much harder to tap into my intuition. Any tips for when you know in advance that a particular meal is going to be challenging? Thanks. So with this one, we've all been there. So you work all day, uh, maybe you missed a snack at some point, you get home and you are starving. And at that point, all good sense pretty much goes out the window and that's your body and biology. That's your body saying, I haven't gotten what I needed. Give me food now and it's gonna want the quickest, fastest, um, most satisfying form of the energy that you need, carbs and fats and protein. Um, so first of all, this is totally normal. I think every human has been to a place where they are so hungry that um, rationality is out the window. It's just the drive-through or ordering on Postmates or grabbing the first thing that is accessible at home. So happens to everybody. Um, and my solution or my suggestions for that are twofold. So on one hand, working on preventing it as best you can, again, we don't live in a perfect world. I never expect perfection from anybody um, and including myself. So it's going to happen, but there are some steps to take to prevent that, which would be um, you know, assessing hunger and fullness levels if you're able to um, throughout the day so that you kind of know you'll expect when you're going to be getting hungry again and planning to have a snack, um, knowing how much time you can go between meals based on what you ate. And so kind of just getting in touch with your body and being able to anticipate when you're going to be hungry next. Um, and what I'm going to do now, actually, I just learned this fancy new technique. There's a million versions of these and no one is necessarily better than another. I just like this one. Um, so the hunger fullness scale kind of takes you on a scale of one to 10. Some of them go zero to 10 of the levels of hunger and the levels of fullness. So a one um, I describe as being like super, super hungry. Like you might pass out, maybe you're lightheaded. Um, ideally, we don't get to a level one. Two is going to be extremely hungry. So you might be moody. That hanger might be kicking in. Uh, maybe headaches. You probably feel your stomach growling. Um, all of those kind of pretty intense hunger, but not like you're going to pass out. 
a three is kind of where it's the sweet spot of hungry and ready to eat. So you're not starving, but um, you're definitely ready to get some nourishment in there. Four is kind of like I could eat. So I'm not starving. I'm not especially hungry, but if I needed to eat, I could definitely eat right now. A five is really neutral. So not hungry, um, not full, not really thinking about food at this point. Six is kind of that um, first level of fullness you might feel after eating. So mild fullness, sort of like um, satisfied to an extent, um, but maybe not emotionally satisfied. You could definitely eat a few more bites. Seven is going to be satisfied. So if you ate any more, you would probably be uncomfortably full. Eight is uncomfortably full. So you might be like unbuttoning your pants. Um, and nine is stuffed. This is Thanksgiving day full, as it says here. So pretty miserable. Um, you know, you don't want to move. You probably feel bloated. Um, it's not very comfortable. And then 10 is like, I'm physically ill. And as it says on here might be, you know, the result of a binge session. So this is the hunger and fullness scale. And what I typically recommend is kind of going in at a three and coming out of a meal at a six. That being said, it's not always going to look like that and it shouldn't. So for example, say you are, let's say you're eating lunch and you know that you're going to have an early dinner, you're meeting some people, um, you know, you're going to eat maybe dinner in a couple of hours. So you might not want to get to the point of like, so full that you might be uncomfortable. Um, or if you ate a little bit more, you might want to stop at like a five or a six, knowing that you're going to eat again in a couple of hours. Um, and kind of the same as far as hunger level, you know, if you are, let's see, um, if you know it's going to be, you know, five, six hours before you're going to be able to eat again, because that's going to be life sometimes, then you might eat at a four, you know, could eat, but really not that hungry because you know, this is your last opportunity to eat for a few hours. So usually we're going in at a two or to a four and coming out at, you know, a five to an eight. As far as uncomfortably full, I mean, if you know it's going to be a long time before you get to eat again, then you might be eating to a little bit of discomfort. Um, so that you aren't starving before the next time you get to eat. So there isn't a perfect way. You're not always going to go in at a three and come out at a six or a seven. Um, but learning to engage that for yourself. So that might be something you could work on in the next week is kind of ranking your hunger and fullness levels before and after your meals to know, you know, how hungry are you when you start to eat a meal and how full are you after? And that might give you some insight into, you know, planning out your meals and snacks for the day. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's one thing you can do to kind of prevent getting to that point where you're hangry and um, kind of all sense of nutrition and well-meaning goes out the window. Another thing would be to work on eating combinations, like eating balanced meals and snacks. So if you're eating something, um, if you watched last week, we talked a little bit about that balanced meal. If you eat things that have carbohydrate, fat, protein, and fiber, it's going to basically slow down digestion. That fat and protein and fiber all slow down the digestion and absorption of carbohydrate, which means that you're going to absorb that sugar, that glucose over a longer period of time. It's going to give you more sustained energy. It's also going to keep you fuller for longer. Um, so instead of just eating an apple, for example, you can have an apple with peanut butter. So you've got protein, fat, carb, fiber. Um, and in the same token, you know, people who think that eating like a chicken or eating chicken and salad is the end all be all um, is probably not going to be as satisfying if say you ate, ate a turkey and cheese sandwich um, and maybe had some chips with it or whatever sounds good to you. So yes, there's eating things that are satisfying. It's also going to be eating things that nutritionally are balanced and it's going to keep you fuller for longer. Okay, so that's prevention. And again, um, that's not life all the time. You're not going to be able to prevent ever getting to the point of hanger. So as far as what you can do in when you're in that situation is to work on having some mindfulness. So knowing you're in this place, so acknowledging it, identifying that, okay, I'm in a situation where I am so hungry that I'm probably not going to make the choice that I would have made if I wasn't. So 
One might be, say you're on the way home, having something like a small snack, whether you have a granola bar, um, a piece of fruit, some chips, something to kind of hold you over. And it's not going to feel satisfying probably in that moment because you're so hungry that the idea of like this little bar is not, doesn't really appeal. Um, but when your body takes the next 15 minutes or so to kind of process it, it's going to take you maybe from like a level two or level one hunger to a level three, which is kind of the sweet spot. So having a small snack, or maybe if you're preparing dinner, you can chop up some whatever you're working on and snack on it um, while you're waiting for dinner. Another one would be once you're sitting down to eat, when you're in this state of like intense hunger, um, having that mindfulness. So limiting distractions as best you can. We tend to um, kind of go on autopilot when we have the TV on or are in having conversations with people, which isn't a bad thing, but it's good to be mindful that you are eating so that you can um, kind of be able to acknowledge your fullness level as you're reaching it or realize how much you're eating even. Um, portioning foods out. So instead of coming home and grabbing that box of crackers and eating out of the box, taking some, putting them in a bowl and then going and sitting at the table and eating them. Um, or instead of, you know, putting all of the food kind of on the table and portioning, you know, just filling up your plate because your eyes are bigger than your stomach, putting out what's appropriate, eating that, sitting with it, you know, for 15, 20 minutes before getting more. Um, and on that note, you know, I'm sure you've heard this and if not, you know, it takes 15 to 20 minutes for your brain to get in touch with your stomach for it to connect that, oh, I am full, like I do have food here. But if you eat in five minutes, you're definitely gonna still feel physically hungry because your brain hasn't had time to catch up. So eating kind of in a, what you would think would be an appropriate amount, what usually fills you up and is satisfying, and then sitting with that for 15 or more minutes to kind of see where you are at that point. If you're still hungry, eat more. If you are not, then you prevented yourself from then overeating in that moment. Um, and yeah, and pacing as well. Um, so making sure that you're not shoveling food in, which again, we all do because we're so hungry. Um, but trying to really be mindful, you know, putting the fork down, having conversation in a way that isn't super distracting. Um, you know, taking sips of water, not eating on autopilot and eating in the five minute period, try to make it at least 15 minutes. Um, I'm not always great about that, but trying to have your meal last at least 15 minutes will help as well. Okay. Um, okay. Comment here. Okay. So, um, comment is I would keep my fridge and pantry almost empty because I knew if I bought things, I would eat too much. Um, and that's a real fear when you know that this is happening a lot. If you are restricting, say, during the day and you get home and you have all of these snack foods available, um, that's a real fear that you're then going to overeat them or go into a binge session. Um, so, you know, eating foods on a regular basis, not restricting throughout the day, giving yourself permission to eat and to eat foods that are satisfying, that will provide physical satiety as well helps to when you are getting home that you can have things like that in the house. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're going to automatically start overeating them. Thanks for sharing. Okay. All right. Um, next one. Is it true that not getting enough sleep may cause binge eating? And I had to do some extra research here because I have an answer. I know the answer, but I wanted to kind of back it up and look into it. And I was surprised that I really didn't find what I was looking for in that direct correlation between in inadequate sleep and binge eating. So the research isn't totally there yet, um, or it's in the preliminary stages, um, which isn't really good scientific evidence. So what I did find, um, or what we already know, is that when we don't get enough sleep, our ability to self-regulate is impaired. And so if you are prone to binge eating or emotional eating, your um, ability to restrain yourself is gonna be even lower. So definitely, if you're not getting enough sleep, you're probably gonna be more prone to binge eating. Um, and then, let's see, oh, the other issue being that chronic um, insufficiency of sleep can also make it really difficult to lose weight if that's something you're trying to do. It's not good for your metabolism. 
Um, and so it can lead to um, weight gain, um, which can then also trigger binge eating as well. Does that answer your question? Cool. All right. Um, and the, the thing I also want to point out there is I did find lots of research on um, the relationship between binge eating and uh, sleep disturbance. So it, there seems to be definitely a correlation there, and it's looking more like um, binge eating is associated with uh, sleep problems, but more in the other way around. Um, and it could be linked to things like depression or anxiety. Um, it's not necessarily binge eating in and of itself, but there's definitely a link there. We just haven't gotten all the way to figuring that out either. So we continue to learn about nutrition and sleep and um, binge eating and emotional eating every day. So we just have to kind of stay tuned and anything I hear, I will let you know. All right. Um, and this question is a really good one. Um, I get this a lot. People who have um, medical conditions think that they can't be an intuitive eater because they need to eat a certain way to manage a medical condition. So the question is, I have health issues. I've been told that I need to lose weight. What strategies can I use to embrace intuitive eating and the need to lose weight for my medical issues? So um, first and foremost, um, an unhealthy relationship with food and the physical and emotional consequences of it are probably going to be as harmful as the physical condition that someone's suffering from. So um, an unhealthy relationship with food, whether you lose weight or you gain weight, is going to create bigger problems down the road. So I usually start with trying to prioritize this to get to where someone can have a healthy relationship with food so that if we do have to make changes for um, management of a medical condition, we can do that in a healthy way. Um, the other issue is, um, you know, a lot of people will lose weight for their medical condition and maybe, maybe that medical condition gets better. But if the weight was lost in an unhealthy and unsustainable way, that person's going to gain the weight back. And so they're going to go right back to where they started with their medical condition. Um, they might even gain more weight or have worsened the medical condition. So if the weight loss isn't done in a healthy way, it's not going to benefit that person long-term, just like you're not going to lose the weight long-term. Um, so yeah, usually I want to start with helping and healing someone's relationship with food, um, unless there's some life threatening, like immediate need, um, to change someone's weight, which is really rare, um, and not something I've really run into any time recently. Um, there's also a way to um, approach health issues in an intuitive way. Um, so, for example, I'm a diabetes educator, and so I always kind of go there in my mind. Um, and so people will be wanting to manage their blood sugar levels. Um, and that doesn't mean necessarily that you need to lose weight to do that. It may or may not help, but there are other things you can do in the meantime. And so eating balanced meals. Um, like I was saying before, eating carbs and fats and fiber and protein, that combination takes longer to digest, keeps you fuller for longer, prevents you from ultimately overeating. Um, and to do that doesn't mean, you know, chicken and sweet potato and broccoli. That carb, fat, fiber, and protein could mean a steak and vegetable stir fry with rice or a pizza and a salad or grilled cheese and tomato soup. It doesn't have to be this idea of what we think is healthy. It's going to be more about that balance. And you can still monitor or manage your blood sugar levels and a lot of other medical conditions without being restricted in the types of foods that you can eat, but focusing more on balance and preventing overeating in a chronic way. Um, and then honoring that hunger and fullness is really going to support metabolic function. So if you're trying to lose weight, then you need a healthy metabolism to do that. And so if you aren't getting everything that your body needs, as we talked about last week, your metabolism is going to slow down and that's going to make it really, really hard for you to lose weight. So honoring hunger and fullness, you can work on that. You can work on challenging the food police. You can work on rejecting diet mentality and still at the same time do whatever you need to do medically like with medical nutrition therapy um, to manage medical conditions. Um, and that's really um, important to note too that health is not determined by weight. And that is a huge 
misconception that we have in our society and this diet culture that we live in. Um, people who are in the normal weight category aren't necessarily metabolically healthy and people in the overweight category aren't necessarily um, unhealthy. So, and that there's research to support that, that people are not receiving the interventions they need because they're normal weight and people are being told to lose weight even though they're metabolically healthy. And so this is a problem that we have. It is a problem in our healthcare system. And I'm not saying that everyone's doctor is, um, you know, not practicing medicine well by recommending weight loss necessarily, um, but that there there is this misconception that if you're overweight, you're automatically unhealthy. Um, and in that, you know, losing weight in an unhealthy way isn't necessarily going to make you healthier or help you manage your medical conditions. Health is going to be determined more by behaviors than it is by weight. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to share this information. I think the more people who are joining us, the more we're all going to benefit from it. So, you know, share this with people that you know, um, get them involved, get them in here. It's super scary until you're here and then you realize how great all of you are, um, how open you are, how supportive you are of each other. Um, and we love doing this. So um, continue to share this with the people that you know could benefit from it. Um, and we'll all just keep working together.